panelists are all here. We've got a very exciting panel of members here to talk to you today. I would like to invite, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, um, Robin Carstensen, coordinate the creative writing program and teaches a lot of creative writing classes to some very brilliant, talented students. And uh, among us brilliant, talented colleagues, supportive, really in a very supportive environment. It's one of the most affirming, inclusive um, you know, er eras in my life, you know, this space that I'm in, so I'll talk about. But I want to introduce Dr. Jenny Sorensen, who would like to uh, shout out uh, the Women's History Month uh, calendar of events and has some flyers for us. Hi. Um, so uh, we are still in February, but next week, March starts, um, and we have a full slate, and I'm going to do 27 events on the back of this flyer for Women's History Month, so almost every day there is something. Um, and we have more flyers over there. Um, and I just wanted to sort of highlight um, some events that the uh, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies minor is really um, proud of and supporting. Our keynote speaker is on Monday, March 23rd, and it'll be Dr. Gabriela Gonzalez from UTSA coming to speak um, about her book project on uh, women activists from South Texas. So her book, her title is Humanizing La Raza, Borderlands Women's Activism, The Politics of Revolution, Benevolence, and Radical Reform. That'll be at 5 p.m. on the 23rd, so mark your calendars now, get a calendar over there and start that event. Um, we also have a bunch of other events throughout the month um, of particular interest potentially to people in this room. We have a feminine artist uh, showcase put on, uh, organized by students in the theater community. Um, but they are welcoming uh, creative writers into that space as well as sort of an open mic, open performance space. And that's Thursday, March 19th at 5 p.m. in the Warren Theater. So we have a bunch of, there's way more on here than that, but there's a bunch of really exciting events in March coming up that um, hopefully build on the spirit of this panel. So, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any announcements? Uh, and I, just, I want to thank uh, Professor Tom Murphy and, and our Associate Dean, uh, Dr. Susan Wolf Murphy, for incredible you know, work in the backgrounds there and, and the forefront and, and, and coordinating all of this. And again, thank you all so much for taking your time out. Um, Emmy Pettis, uh, from, uh, who's in teaching in Rio Grande Valley and some uh, incredible poet, has once said that the audience bring in your energy and your listening energy, and that kind of li that the listening that you offer is it takes a lot. Of, it takes a lot of energy, and so we really appreciate your energy that you're bringing in um, to, to participate and make all this happen. Um, I was going to do a completely different introduction, and then uh, Abigail Keegan, who's coming from uh, Oklahoma, we were talking as we do as poets gather. We're, we're talking as scholars and poets. We're, Talking and I, you know, I started to talk about my personal story in the in the queer movement and LGBTQ community. And Abigail said, "Look, d ditch ditch that and talk about your personal story." So I, I've got some fragments of thoughts, and I was actually up till 5 a.m. So I'm kind of like shaking from caffeine and nervousness, and um, so I'm gonna just read a few things. In 1982. Before the first pride parades floated through cities in small you know, makeshift trails of VW bugs and station wagons and ribbons and drag queens waving, I was, I was returning home to New Jersey from California and Spokane, Washington, where I was stationed in the Air Force. And I was giddy with love and tenderness and giddy with Casey Stewart. Uh, and a song that, you know, the lyrics to a song that wouldn't come out till 26 later in the summer of 2008 by Katy Perry. Um, <laughs> Katy Perry, who, who sang the song, I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It. So that's a little bit where I was at the time, giddy with love and tenderness. And we had met in an operating room in an orth over orthopedic surgery. I was an orthopedic tech and I was you know, retracting muscles and uh, she was the scrub tech. Uh, exchanging the sterile equipment. And uh, we had a 24-hour marathon game of foosball in the dorm rooms of Fairchild Air Force Base, which led to other kinds of deft handiwork and hours of conversation and nervousness rippling over us. And then, um, you know, so here I am. So I return to my uh, family during the 
Christmas holidays and I was giddy and swooning with swagger uh, in my household which with my field artillery army airborne ranger father and my post-World War II German, German born and raised mother who were curious about my swagger swoon. And so as I was springing gaily forward around the household, this coiled energy of love. And um, so, so my mother asked me, you know, I don't mean to offend you, but are, are you gay? And uh, so without missing a beat, because I was raised in a, a household of duty and honor and truth prevailing, um, where a child uh, whose name was called in our household, our very hair follicles would quiver and snap to attention. If you've watched the 1979 movie with Robert Duvall, The Great Santini, about the US Marine Corps officer, that was my mother and father kind of rolled into The Great Santini. And so in that household, so I sort of, you know, with a hush and enthusiasm and prideful knowing said, yes, I'm gay to the faces of the military industrial complex for whom that would have been an egregious sin and deeply threat, profoundly threatening to the military you know, community in which the heterosexuality was, is paramount. You know. And so um, my mother said to me, I didn't raise a disgusting queer. And so that was what the queer, you know, the queer, the stigma of queer, and that sort of echoed throughout the decades in my psyche. And so it's, it's really kind of interesting how here I am 38 years later, and it's such a different world in some way, many, many ways, and it's an incredible um, experience to be here. Um, so I just, uh, meanwhile, um, I'll talk about in the 1980s, at 1982, when queer was such a pejorative term, an officer and gentleman uh, film was coming out with the famous line of steers and queers line, uh, uttered by Lewis Gossett's character, Emil Fullery, the gunnery sergeant to Richard Gere's character at the Aviation Naval Academy. And three years later, a variation of that would be echoed again in Full Metal Jacket. It was actually echoed six years earlier by Matt Dillon character, Matt, Matt Dillon's character in another movie. Um, so while I was in the military, I was working very hard at surviving as straight and passing as straight so that I could survive. And meanwhile, I watched some of my dear friends, one of them, a Raphael from Sinton, Texas, just down the road, getting booted out, dishonorably discharged, changing their life trajectory, um, their psyches and their access to emotional, mental, uh, physical health uh, for being quite not straight. And so, and meanwhile, secretly, during my different stations in California, I was stationed in, in Turkey and traveled in the Middle East, I also joined a drag performance group. So I was medic by day and drag king by night. And I was doing this, you know, <laughs> so years before, uh, and then meanwhile, Jack Halverston, then Judith Halverston, would be working on their notes to female masculinity. And I was singing Kenny Rogers, you know, with Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton duos, and I had no idea about feminism and the queer movement because I'm in the military, but I'm in this subculture in the military. Um, I won a meritorious medal in 1985 for performing actually Tina Turner's Proud Mary, donning a wig with three other guys in an officer's club. And they, one of the officers, higher ranking guy, came into the clinic one day and said, I'm gonna give you a medal for your performance, you know, and taking care of the troops, kind of thing. Um, and meanwhile, I was taking English classes at the University of Maryland overseas at night while I was doing my medic duties during the day. So, so that was really a saving grace. And I was writing a 22 page handwritten essay entitled a Antimicrobial Therapy in Human Parasitic Related Diseases. And the cover of Time Magazines in that year, 1985, was a cover of the AIDS epidemic. And so this is where I'm coming from. And meanwhile, if it became suspect that I was anything but just performing, you know, gender, transgendering, and performing um, anything, um, you know, doing anything other than performing non-heterosexuality, then, you know, I could, then I was barraged with different kinds of sexual assault, which my entire military career was just sort of 
and navigating this gauntlet of sexual assaults as a woman and a whole rank and file from non-married to married men in, you know, in their homes and in the quarters of medical supply cabinets. And, and so those are details for, for poetry and other conversations. But just to let you know, I, I am pa part of a, a whole you know, history of women in the military and LGBTQ <coughs> individuals coming from a very entrenched, um, toxic, you know, hyper masculinity culture. Um, so that was navigating that system. And uh, sorry, um, you know, the pushing, the shoving in corners, and and so and and giving guys more ammunition to test the property that I, that women were and LGBTQ community individuals were. And uh, so anyway, I survived that. Meanwhile, in the 80s, as I'm doing that, you know, surviving the military overseas, back in the States, you may have heard of Mel White, who became a, one of the Christian leaders of the Metropolitan Community Church. But he was living out his memoir notes, uh, which was published in 1991, Stranger at the Gate, to be gay and Christian in America. And basically, he's chronicling the uprising of the right wing Christian conservative movement through the 80s that launches a sweeping attack on the LGBT community, demonizing it, has a devastating impact on you know, thousands and thousands of individuals and families um, to access health care and basic acceptance and belonging. And even in our coastal bay community, there was one doctor who, was, who would be willing to see AIDS patients through a radius and radius of miles and miles. And he just is getting a plaque now uh, through the Coastal Men Wellness Foundation, which was formerly, in 1986, the Coastal the AIDS Foundation. And I find it, you know, it's, it is devastating. We are in a Trump administration era now, which is launching increasingly aggressive, you know, deregulation policies uh, since the Reagan era against the environment and a deep, uh, disturbing platform against LGBTQ, women, people of color. Meanwhile, I'm reading Leslie Feinberg's Stone Butch Blues, Trans Liberation. I'm deep, I'm writing on the mist wars. We, but well before Facebook, we had feminist forums and LGBTQ forums, and we're all writing to each other. It's a huge community, which a lot of those shut down. Ms. Magazine, Robin Morgan, started uh, the Ms. forums um, discussion. We had huge debates, years and years of debates over Mich Wimigan, Michigan Women's Festival you know, contentious uh, debates over women born women, trans women, you know, what the access to safe space, and I could go on and on. Um, finally, we're getting documentaries of Sylvia Ramirez and the role of and trans women in the Stonewall riots, which, you know, had sort of been suppressed um, for many, many years. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm coming here at the university, finally, out of the military. I, moved into Texas, the, ended up here with a, my first partner whose family is from Kingsville. And I said, yeah, I don't really know if I want to live in Kingsville, but hey, Corpus looks really pretty, so let's settle here. And uh, really started to read uh, Radical Feminists at that time, all of Mary Daly's books, who in Mary Daly is really misrepresented, I think nowadays, given a, just a blurb in feminist anthologies and I read reading all of Audre Lorde's you know, essays and poetry and June Jordan and Sheila Jeffrey. So the radical feminist, and Naked in the Promised Land by uh, Lillian Foderman, who then also so deeply uh, profound work and reading the memoirs of all these people who made it very possible for us to be here now, like hard, hard, long sacrifices and years and years of work to Lillian, Lillian Foderman is one of the first, if not the first, a woman to be on a faculty senate at a university and actually uh, survived a lot of um, a, a oppression for suggesting that we include women in literature by women. And she also came out with one of the first Chicana anthologies. And so, really, if you get a chance to read some of this memoir, these memoirs, it's incredible. And came up with ethnic studies and LGBTQ studies. And so, um, it's incredible where we stand now, and I'm almost done here. Um, but we, and so we need to do better though. It, the, it, the hashtag It Gets Better campaign from well-meaning celebrities 
And yet here we are, students, young people are dying all around us from being bullied uh, for, and then taking their lives in a culture and society, society emboldened by the rhetoric of Trump and um, perpetuating homophobia, transphobia across our cultural in institutions that have direct, permanent, terrible consequences on, again, our psyches, our mental, physical, emotional health of our, of our individuals, families, and communities. Uh, so it, it's, and we're in peril with a treasonous president who endangers our national security, allows and cultivates ex and, you know, increasing division in our culture, hatred against immigrants, policies that cage children, separates families, destroys environmental protections. <coughs> And so I was just thinking of Natalie Diaz of the Mojave Nation who tweeted just yesterday in response to an article about tribal nations in the Sonoran Desert condemning the wall construction, destruction of sacred indigenous land in an oasis that supported 16,000 years. And she tweets, I wish these actions by your government will be an issue in your minds of your, in your minds right now. Native bodies have been treated this way in the United States and the Americas forever. And we see how this value has been inflicted upon the Brian Rock Salt, the black, LGBTQ, plus disabled, etc. So now here we are, an entire slew of top cabinet officials charged with corruptions, mountains of incontrovertible evidence against them. It's still emboldening the neo-Nazis, the entire GOP, uh, that is scared and hand-tied, hog-tied by the corporate powers while benefiting financially. So yes, we have lots of work to do. And yet, here I am, so 38 years later, at the Island University, a few years ago at the Pride Alliance Student Organization, I was invited to a series called Queering the Island, which was started with uh, Dr. Jason Farr and Dr. Sarah Salter continues this inviting queer faculty to share their scholarship and experiences. And so I'm standing on a little peak of seeing 50 years behind me. And it's an extraordinary position to be in now, to see how far we've come, to have lived that, to have survived that, and to have had, and have a, a tremendous opportunity. And I feel I'm in a safer space than I've ever been. 20 years ago, I could, couldn't have come out as a teacher. You, you would lose, lose authority in the classroom. Um, it wasn't safe, it wasn't safe for, uh, for our students, and now I'm surrounded by affirming, inclusive students, and we're in the majority, and it's an incredible place to be. Um, and so I'm honored to be on this, you know, to be able to facilitate a panel, um, and there's more that I've written, but I've got to, we've got to move on to the panel now that's come, and I want to introduce, um, thank you again, uh, Joe Reyes uh, Boitel, who I, I met in San Antonio at the Gemini Inc. conference, and got to hear you. I've heard you read your work, and I've read your new book. And Joe Reyes Boitel is a poet, essayist, playwright, uh, born in Minnesota somehow, and family calls Texas, Florida, Mexico, and Cuba home. Uh, recent forthcoming publications include the Scalawag Journal, the Windward Review, Chachalaca uh, Review, Borderlands, and the Americas Review. Recent performances include excerpts of This Body, focused on desire and self-acceptance, and her book Michael plus Josephine, reimagines Saint Michael the Archangel as a queer woman who begins a relationship with Josephine, a disaster relief worker. So please join me in welcoming Joe Race, Rachel. Issues. There were 
issues of like who belongs here, even within those two communities, or which Trump would say we're all Mexican and none of us belong. You know, he likes to say everyone is Mexican. God help him. Um, but uh, it was hard to write it, and I really hurt myself in writing it. It wasn't until after I had gotten through the bulk of that that I realized that I needed to write about love. And so I woke up one morning going, screw this, I'm gonna, because I, I had a habit of waking up on the weekends about five, do a couple of hours of writing, then go back to sleep for a bit. So I woke up and, and I found a feather the day before, like feathers are all over, we have a ton of birds, right? But um, a feather right in my pathway, and it was white, and it was gorgeous, just fluffy, it was just beautiful, beautiful feather. I picked it up, which I normally wouldn't do, and I had it on my desk, and I was like, why would a feather just show up right in front of me? And um, I know, because I'm special, right? Yes, <laughs> but I needed that moment, like you grab at things to make yourself feel like you're really there, you know? So, um, so I looked it up, and of course, because I'm a Google Bruja, I always say I'm a Google witch. Like, things are, like, see what the symbols are across the cosmos. And it said that Saint Michael will appear and leave like a feather if he's in your path or helping you. And so I'm like, well, that's interesting. And then so then I do another Google search for images of Saint Michael, and I'm thinking, Saint Michael really is kind of queer. I mean, really with the coat and the extra and all the cheer of cheeks. I think that one looks so beautiful. But so then I'm thinking, well, well, maybe it was like Joan of Arc, who was a woman, or maybe like so many of our, you know, in our history of women who who dressed as men but were not and fought battles and everything. Yeah. And I thought, well, we all fight battles. If you're a woman at any point in your life, you know you fight a battle. And um, every day, right? And so I thought, I'm gonna make St. Michael queer, yay, you know? And so I wrote every day two to three poems um, of St. Michael and an all female without, you know, any kind of, uh, and then all of a sudden I got really excited and I texted like 10 friends because one morning I woke up and Josephine showed up and I'm like, yes, now we have something. So I was really excited to be able to do a queer love story that for, that for me, I mean, I did it, it's a novel in verse, so if you like to read, if you don't like to read, but you say you like to read, this is the perfect kind of book for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, because it misses all like the dull parts, like they put one boot on at a time, it's like, no, you know, it really is just like, get to the kissing, right, or something. So, <laughs> so I'll read a few so you get an idea of St. Michael. Thank you for bringing me this. <laughs> Yours is missing a page, no, it's not, it's, it's good. St. Michael's Logic. St. Michael is feeling badass, has cut her hair, and everyone says her ears are very nice. St. Michael walks around wearing her lover's old shoes left in the haste of moving out. When St. Michael sees her former love at the bar or planetarium, she remembers her monstrous words, I have moved to a time before you existed. And so St. Michael, without pleasantries or concerns, Let's the shoes walk her across the marbled floor. Smooth. St. Michael says, if she really believes I don't exist, she won't be compelled to turn as I pass. And that one even caught me. So I was like, I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn. So, um, and so I'll do this one. St. Michael recalls how she met Josephine. With autumn comes the sky forever powdered orange. It's a harvest party, and Michael first saw a woman the color of gold with a laugh that shook her hair down her back into a cascade of leaves. Later that evening, they were introduced formally. Josephine, this is Archangel Michael. Michael, Josephine, both smiled. And when St. Michael spoke of having visited the Dominican Republic, Josephine offered a few steps of merengue, leaving Michael no choice but to offer her elbow and lead Josephine to the dance floor. They left together that night dancing. So as you can tell, with um, two very busy people who are disaster relief workers, they have difficulty in getting together. So at some point, they miss each other. They are doing their work um, to help or to improve the world. But yeah, there's arguments at some point. So I'll read you 
this one of an argument they've had, or the actor of an argument. Josephine collects the dishes. Not exquisite china, but sturdy ceramic. Dark blue in the face, gritty, bitter white on the broken cusps. <coughs> Josephine picks up the largest pieces from the floor. She considers options for what can be done, but the pointed edges, the curled lip of bowls, all that comes to mind are the tender gold corrections of Japanese pottery, the art of broken pieces. Sometimes we are art, sometimes we are pieces, she says to Michael, who has flown away, who always flies away after a fight. But Josephine knows her angel her. She leaves the broken stack on the kitchen counter. Already the cat is rubbing his face on the painted edge. There is work to do, and so all of this will have to wait. When she returns, the house is dark and cool, purple blue with dim chandelier. The dishes together again, soft gold marks running across each face. So St. Michael, um, actually of the two, St. Michael probably does the most growing um, within the book, and that's because Josephine has had to live as a human and has done her work, and St. Michael has not. So um, here's Dark Star. St. Michael cannot sleep. If sleep comes, it will not stay. Impossible to coax it to her chest, to warm her heart, to warm her at winter's start. It's a little easier in the summer with its limitless sun to pretend her world hasn't changed. Evening's chill brings longing. The sheets twist around her legs, candlelight, shallow breaths. She misses reaching for Josephine's fingers, dark walls of her dwelling offer no consolation. This annoyance, prickly skinned and vaporous. It's clear now, St. Michael realizes she's angry, so angry, and with only herself to blame. Because there is no other way 
It's called survival. Even as the land loses some of itself each time the water rushes in, without warning a faded meaning, this muddled space. Why all this call for destruction? Michael sees the hurt, but also the reach for those who would undo its chaos. There are no levees for this life, nothing to ease it from the water's edge. Pain will take the time it will take. Clean the heart of this place, claim it as its own. <coughs> St. Michael works on herself. So my idea is that St. Michael spent way more time not in the company of humans than with humans. So of course, <coughs> she needs to work on some things. Incapable of love, Josephine said, misspoken surely for how can the archangel created and charged by God to protect and support humans be anything but love? And yet, so little of Michael's life was in the presence of humans. God's breath pushed into Michael before the earth's making, before the cosmos itself, the surrounding darkness and its first burst of light, the vibration of creation residing within her without conflict. Love is creation. Love is constant. Love is patient. For humans, love begins and ends with what lives at arm's reach. Before humans, love was one breath shared without doubt in its sustainability, without doubt within each celestial body. Doubt is a moonless winter night where humans birth their questions, then fill each with inevitable choice. This is why we come together to pull at the beauty within the darkness, but doubt also fosters fear, loss. Michael witnessing the first fight she called it lack of understanding, possession. And the world crumbled into pieces, continents rushed away, water gulfing between, a momentary chance for calm. <coughs> Still, Michael couldn't separate herself from this, couldn't say this wasn't also her path. Not when she'd already fallen so completely. Michael now linked with these lives, their hearts imprinted within her. Her ribcage swells with short, wet breaths, and tears will not stop ushering in brokenness. Love is ever growing, bodies stretched tight around a knot. Acceptance of this is a pledge to stay vulnerable again and again. Whether angel or human, we are cracked open by love, Michael realizes, as sure as the universe expands. as well as the pure organicism of pain and pleasure. They are currently working on a master's creative thesis on the subject of the abstraction of universal knowledge from subverting lens of understanding, i.e. cultural compartmentalizing of basic truths and emotion in the body as connections <laughs> to primal knowledge. And Zoe didn't write this, but Zoe went through our uh, undergraduate creative writing minor and has a body of, of work collected and has won English Haas Awards and won a first year, uh, first award in the collegiate contest at the Scissor Tail Festival and read to a distinguished, huge distinguished crowd in, in uh, Ada, Oklahoma, Eastern Oklahoma University. Central. I'm sorry, Eastern, Eastern Central. Ken Heda here, here is who runs the scissor tail. Um, but, so Zoe didn't put any of that in their bio, but I just did wanted to let you know a little bit of the background. Also, Zoe is the managing editor of the Winter Review, and I was supposed to wear my pink pussy hat. I, I forgot it, I'm sorry. So just pretend I have a pink pussy hat and we're a, a team here. 
that Tom allowed me to sort of change my plan last minute and so I am a big believer in only really presenting what you really care about even if it's not the most well edited work and I have to be honest with you guys I, I decided to show you some of my visual poetry and some of my handwritten poetry today just because it's it's really important to me at this point um, and my bio, it talked only about my thesis project because that's basically everything that's on my mind right now is my thesis, if I'm being honest. I couldn't even remember anything else. But um, so a, a lot of these, most of these are going to contribute to my thesis, if not going to be a part of the, um, my creative thesis. Uh, I'm in the English program, by the way, the master's program here. Um, and so a lot of these are sort of forming the, you know, the basis of that work. And what it is, is a, it's an exploration of primal knowledge. And maybe I'll talk more about that, maybe I won't. But the idea is to um, sort of use poetry as a way to do research into the architecture of the unknown, right? And so to sort of elevate creativity, you know, and make it on par with um, you know, scientific research in a way, or really just to kind of, um, you know, have an erasure of these labels of science and art, um, because a lot of people know it, and um, some of you haven't met me yet. I was actually in the chemistry master's program before I came into the English master's, and I'm so glad I made that change, and so that's, that's sort of what forms my inspiration here. That's my background, but um, I want to kind of try and jump into it here. Um, I hope this works. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh I see you on the end of the slide. Bear with me, folks. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna start with something simple, and, and this is what some of my visual poetry looks like, by the way, and just throwing it out there, I, I don't consider myself a great artist. I prefer to call these my doodles, um, and you know, I just kind of meditatively work on these things, and so I had to adapt most of these writings in order to read them out loud, because usually they're more stream of consciousness in automatic writing, um, but it sort of gets at the, um, at the truth of the matter when it comes to what you really want to write about. And I don't remember who the, the student author this year was, but I remember that she spoke so wisely about writing being um, just the ultimate truth for you. You know, that's what writing is, it's truth. Um, so I don't remember her name. Then, uh, yes. Yeah, Laura Silva. All right. And then uh, okay. the last Laura Silva, the author's name. All right, and this is called Real Sun. Uh, I wrote it for my great-great-grandmother. Right. Um, my great-great-grandma was a sage woman, a sage woman when her husband was at the sheath, philandering with another half-known moon or gun, man's things, whatever that meant in 1843. She protected the harvest she had to. People were different then, but not really, just as jaded. She could feed herself with nothing but dirt, roots, real sun, two hands, and wet. Anyone could, but she knew it before they did. Love. She said it first, nothing more. But no longer for him. She fed herself while he slept in other wombs, comfort, dark on other earths, laid down his ship, claimed his own empty island just to feel a little more free. Probably he had a lot of love to give, but not to her because she wasn't his. 
Lynn would say. She saved a shotgun down her boot for safekeeping, not for pleasure. Just like she saved her husband for 56 years. She didn't want to use it or use him like a brother to her, too scared, too small, a premature baby of feelings for another human to name. She fed herself over ripe juice of nutritive unknown fruits, giving her the metabolism for a puny. Fence movers donned a dissolved particle dust, dust bridge to more bridge. When he came back for more, she led him to his next commission. Past the corn, she had been tending the pigs and the chickens. She had made a small house for him to live in because she wouldn't let him back in her bed. Her. Thank you. Um, all right, so that was a pretty simple one. Um, getting into this one, uh, it's, it's going to sort of get into more of the stream of consciousness style. And I often make these for gifts and I make them as tribute to people who I really admire because I feel like it's a waste to just kind of make these for myself. But I made these made this uh, for as a tribute to a woman um, who sadly passed away when they were 27 and they were a psychiatrist. And so I, I actually write to them, I journal to them as though they can talk to me whenever I feel like I need a counselor. And so I decided to make a piece of artwork for them. Um, so this is called Heaven Girl. Sanctuary. Been thinking too much about this refuge. Nothing comes close. I don't share this a lot, but you should know I talk to myself. I am my own, my, I am my own most cherished friend but it's taken a while to get here. Let me tell you words and situations, tell me secrets nobody else can hear, as the specialness of what I've witnessed is an inseparable part of its experience, and everything, everything seems so special. And there's some things that I feel I must say, not that I'm special, but everyone is. Everyone has different ridges on their brain, different bo box bodies of experience, Rivulets of everything that has happened to them in history, life, tempered, we could never know. Everyone is special. Heaven girl, ironic counselor who's already dead. If you die at 27, that, is, that mean that there's no 28 you. You'll be 27 forever. And does releasing your body from your mind, death, make your essence pure? Does it make you less yourself? The sensitive human waver? from across the room. Heap paradox, if you take away something particle to particle, does it become less and less what it is, whatever it is, until it becomes not what it is? At what instant does it become no longer what it is and what it isn't? What is it then? Chaos theory, butterfly effect, even small things can make a big difference when time is allowed to pass and changes exponentially induced more and more changes in things, movements in the cosmic universe of time heaving desperately, endlessly in only one direction. You, small you, could be the speck of dirt in this galaxy that causes the end of everything and anything. But maybe it wouldn't really be your doing because you're just the tiniest speck of dirt who can never know what it would take to turn the right leaf over to cause the annihilation of yourself but I still like to write to myself, with myself, for myself, like it's another person across the room. And it's okay. What do you say? In this universe of movements leading to more movements, just being is decentering. We cannot know something in language and spirit without foregoing some qualities of it. All things must first be divided before they can be known. Nightmare, see through mind, falls out of your hands. Just being is decentering. Everything will be everything and nothing with time. Just being is decentering because we foam at the mouth. Agony, become less whatever this is, bend by bend, crunch. Even orifices and pores we have are so full of seething alive. Emptiness, virtual particle, pus. 
Never clean, never nothing, never clean, never nothing, never clean, never nothing, not even empty. Space is really empty. How could you ever be lonely? But colors are just a name used to delineate a particular common perceptual experience. Colors as we know them are nothing but a reflection of light at a certain wavelength, a function of the chemical qualities of the thing that the color is seen on. But the colors of our emotions follow far fewer rules, and losing them is much more tragic. Black is not really a color, but 11 years later, your father still wears black. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, does anyone here know what virtual particles are? Anyone? A little bit? Heard of it? Okay. Well, they're a real thing, and that's what I was inspired by here. It's the idea of, if you've ever, ever wondered what makes up empty space, if it's possible to have empty space, well, it isn't really, because um, just based on chance, it's, you know, things just kind of appear out of nowhere based on the equations that make up the energy, what it can form, and so virtual particles, there's really no such thing as empty space. Um, look it up, you guys. <laughs> I'm not a physicist, but um, very interesting stuff. Okay, um, so I'm gonna read some handwritten poetry. Um, it's much shorter, all right, and okay. I won't bore you by giving away my thesis, um, but I'm going to warn you that I'm going to ramble a little bit as well on some theoretical prattlings just to see how it fits. All right, um, so I appreciate you listening, but I'll, I'll get into it now. All right. Dead ends on your mind now. It's too late to say you want an extra day sinking in the sand, waiting for the tide to take you slowly. Be reasonable, fucker. The sun will come alive, cut off your limbs, burn a hole in your throat way before the water will ever accept you. It's so like you to want to be able to choose who hates you. But this mind is free. It's the dirt beneath your feet, granular inside you between toes and other holes, blistering. Stop pretending this is what you wanted. I know your heat better than you. I'm no fucking god. I'm free of nothing, nothing and free. Say it with me. Real love hurts, and nothing else, no need. Real love eats you like a lion, not knowing your name or what name is and what knowing is. It's superficial in its taste and nutrient profile. Why wouldn't it be? It's a function of animalia. If we want to believe that we can love, love must be a bodily thing too, not just a magical, fluffy thing that exists outside you and around you in its perfection. Love has needs like a gear, grinding into your bone stuff while you're still alive, like fuck, 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 there's more to life than what you can touch. And what, what, what am I? An animal who needs food, a germ that needs infection just by virtue of continuing to live? Um, so, and I don't have all of these up there, um, but I'm just gonna, read through some of these things, and sometimes I like to challenge myself intellectually, so if I ever seem mad, I'm really just mad at myself or kind of sparring with myself. Um, okay. All right, well, that's fine. It hit me, burned itself in. Why do we have to be gracious for friends? Since you say we're all full of shit and existing on it, for it, with it, when we let our odd selves be, if this is how it's meant to be, our mission, then why do I feel so worthless? And why am I so nothing fresh, apple with no skin? I told you from the beginning I'd never plant sickly roots in any soil. I'm sorry I did. I'm just made of need and needing something to just exist on delay final death just a little while longer. For me, what I, what I mean when I say I'm a poet is that poetry is my language, and not only that, it's love itself for me. 
But despite how much I love words, my odd friend brain has whispered to me that words are nothing but a transmutation of the actuality, capital U, universe, the noumenal, witnessed by one, translated into sounds which are derived from the unique language universe and perceptual universe of an individual, molded into something altogether different and more textured than words sitting there on paper. Words are not the end of what is out there, though they are a substantive translation or picture. In the same way, our universe of understanding, our capacities of thought, are also not the end of what's out there. In fact, this means that our cognizance of the substance and meaning of what we say is not a limit of the substance or meaning of what we say. All this means is that you may not immediately know what your worth is, but you are never just what you believe yourself to be. I'm not afraid of being drawn to pleasure. I have no shame for it. I don't believe in shame, but I still feel it sometimes. But when I do, I have no shame for my shame. So just as soon as I feel it, it becomes nothing. Because in being aware of my own disbelief and shame, shame no longer exists. Shame is not shame anymore. It's just so, so much just something different, something you couldn't be afraid of because it's out there and you feel it. It must be something that's a part of everything, the vast universe of senselessness and sensibility coalescing and becoming one. Um, I hear you now, reaching so hard to fill that fissure in my soul. Little did I know that pain is love, but in time it all comes to mean something more than the bend of time, fire and wood, swallow whole, like we're not made for this swallowing whole. And I'm going to read it fast, all right? But um, it's called Creature, Here I Am. I wonder how I'll die. Bodies. Does my body know more than me? Does my body know how I'll die? In failure and comfort, friend, I listen to the Jesus in my head. I can always be honest with me, with him. I am one hell of a creator. I am one hell of a creature. You can always be honest with me. I'm one hell of a creature. Creature, I want to compliment you on just how much you don't care, how much I want to tell you how much. Special skin, dread. Dread already spins us fully on its axis here, so complete without even needing you to fill its stomach in. Dread, dread too cold to turn around from. I need something to kick me alive once again, even if it hurts. I'm roadkill on the street and all too willing. I want to compliment you on just how much you don't give a fuck. That drives me nuts. Am I ever educated enough to affirm that I am not? Too many questions don't make you smart. It just makes you redundant and aware of it. What are we doing here? Deathly glare of infinitude of intelligence, emotions, whatever that is. In thinking about how much we just shatter the ones we love too much. Too much as though there's a figure. Too much, name your price. There's too much to give up just to break into yourself, creature, soft creature. And what is it? Soft puppet skin? Signs and every damn thing, just a plaything. People creature, empty skin, movement you're made of, decay movement becomes whatever it is meant to be, dead as always, decay, rolling stone, too much. This isn't anything special if it isn't too much. Am I too quiet or something else? What is this? Empty skin, callous red, useless, overfed on wrong stuff or whatever, just to feel like everyone else. Diet, just like everyone else, empty skin, vestigial wastefulness, you couldn't cut off. And death takes its place as your master, the gravity to your matter form, pulling you into yourself, making things slowly break and writhe and dry up, and making money vanish making your purpose instantly turn to nothing. It doesn't even steal it with a human avarice. Death doesn't want your purpose. Death knows that pain is your only real birthright. All right. <laughs> Thank you.
Officer Rob Jackson, who um, was part of the ground uh, learn developing the learning communities, uh, and also is a our uh, he's, uh, we commemorate our Rob Jackson, you know, uh, high school poetry contest after Rob Jackson. But he told me a long time ago, sometimes the best that you can do as a teacher is to just create a learning space and step the fuck out of the way and let your students, you know, do what they're gonna do. And it's been, a uh, so it's been really such a, one of my greatest joys as a teacher to be able to, to um, work with you and write poetry with you and see, uh, to, to see you, you grow as a writer, it's just, wow. Um, so thank you so much for sharing such innovative, important, urgent work. We're gonna move on and I would like to introduce Anel Flores. Oh wow, uh, was awarded Women's Advocate of the Year from the University of Texas, San Antonio, and the Nebrija Creadores Award from the Universidad de Alcala de Aneves in Madrid, Spain. Please forgive me if I, I try to pronounce things properly. Um, Flores was named Best of San Antonio Local Author, the Chingona and Literature Award, the Ancinas Award, Esqua Valley, the NALAC Fund for the Arts Award, the Oxion Women Inspiring Women Award, the Yellow Rose of Texas Educator Award, and the Mentorship Leadership Award from the National Performance Network. She is co-editor of forthcoming Jota Anthology with Karima Press and author of Lambda Literary Award nominated book, Empanada, a Lesbiana Story in Provarita. So thank you for uh, joining me and welcoming Anel Flores. Thank you. Wow, what a beautiful um, campus. I never have been here and I just heard about it. And for a minute, my daughter almost came here and we were deciding, but I'd never driven up. And I, it was gorgeous to like drive and see this, the ocean and the most beautiful, to me the most beautiful part of this land that we have is this coast um, along, um, along uh, this gulf, along Texas. I'm from Brownsville, so I spent a lot of time up and down and up and down and driving back and forth because my family at one point we were in San Antonio, we're in San Antonio now and before that in Dallas, so we would always every weekend drive to the valley because it was an obligation to see the, the abuelos on the weekend. So we would, you know, five for the 5.30 after work, get in the car, all the kids, mom and dad, drive home, see the abuelos, take care of them, cook, clean, pay their bills, run errands, drive back to either San Antonio and Dallas. I mean, this was every weekend. It was the way that I lived. So the ocean to me is a very, very special place. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, uh, Texas a and Corpus Christi. Thanks to the Maya, to the ocean, to mm -hmm. the spirit, and um, all of our um, First Nation people who were here way, 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 way before we ever knew this was anything. Uh, university, and not anything, it was the sacred land. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely invite um, our ancestors here today because this land is the most precious land that we have on Turtle Island. And uh, I'm happy to know that and really believe it. So um, I will start, I was gonna start with something else, but some, the, the little tears coming into my lips are telling me to read this. Uh, this is called Sin Vergüenza on the Banks of the Water. Um, and the Sin Vergüenza means two things. I will translate, normally I won't, by the way. So normally you could just get a dictionary and look it up. But I will translate today because Sin Vergüenza means without shame. Um, but it's also a plant. If you're familiar with this plant, it has these little leaves. It's very small, like the little leaves are tiny, but they are even tinier leaves that are shaped kind of like this. They go together, and when you touch it, the, the leaves close up. Has anyone seen that? It's the most gorgeous plant ever. And so I played with it when I was a kid, and when I visit the Rio Grande, um, this border, <laughs> Um, that I used to walk across and we would get on the, the Chalan and travel from, from the U.S. side, uh, which was Los Alamos, Texas, to Diaz Ordaz, uh, Tamaulipas. We would have, I would get on that thing for a nickel as a baby with no supervision, just a bunch of kids, and we would just like go to Mexico. Like we didn't need an ID, we didn't need nothing. Uh, we just dirt and little, a wooden little ferry that crossed. It was hand-pulled. So 
I wrote this based on that little plant, living without shame, living on these borders, um, living uh, in this land that is really one, one land, one space. Sin vergüenza on the banks of the water. Palm trees rush by my car window like a mosca passing by. We're more than halfway there when brown vendors peep out behind small buckets of oranges looking scared. I feel like we have to stop, like we have to buy something. You mutter to me, tap my shoulder aimed at the wheel. They're out here working to feed their family and it's hot as hell. Thank God for the wind from the coast, I think and stop. Brown baby about two feet tall, hair cut like a deflated soccer ball, steps in and out of a red fruit box on the ground. She sits on the ground, sits in the box and laughs, stands up, laughs, steps out, laughs so hard her body folds over. You don't stop staring at the small girl repeating her thrill in the red basket, out of the red basket and again laughing. I pick a couple oranges because it will only be the, the two of us for the next few days. Mommy and Papi don't know I still have a key to the casita beside the Arroyo Colorado River. Mommy and Papi don't know about you. I reach for the last papaya in the basket, shuffle my hands through the large multi-limbed leaves, wrap my whole hand around her flesh, take her musky scent into my nose. She is ripe. I'm going to dig my teeth into you when we finally get there. When I turn to motion for you, for your approval on my fruta selection, I don't see you. You're squatting on the ground playing canicas with a kid who could be a boy or a girl. Lucky kid, I think. Kid has the same deflated soccer ball haircut, faded blue shorts, plain white t-shirt, and the collar grayed. Dad told me once he used to cross kids illegally from Mexico when it was easier to hide them. My abuela even brought expensive parrots in her bra once. They were drunk on a sip of tequila. <laughs> Wonder if this kid came like that, I think. Every car racing down 77 towards the border makes me question. Are they gonna go pick up Mexicans hiding in suitcases and ice chests the way you were snuck into the States? Sorry you had to go through that, but Sorry, there's so much. Lucky me, I think. We are headed towards familia, memories, abandoned. El Golfo de Mexico, La Laguna Atascosa, La Pesca, La Paz, Lenguaje left behind, juntos, time to be alone, and my best and the best Mexican food. One delicious reminder of home. I can almost smell the ocean, I tell you but you don't hear me over the highway cars and whipping leaves. The wind slaps her hand on my ass, pushing, forcing me to skip to the next wooden table of cositas for sale, sal, limon, peanuts, chicles, empanadas, y dulce de bruta I can't identify. Grab me some of those, you tell me, tossing an extra big black canica down on the dusty scattered globos of colored glass. We'll be driving for another two hours before we get there, I'm gonna be hungry. Out from behind the table, a tiny abuelita about the same height of the canica shark rises from an old wooden fruit box. Her hands are open, smile is too. Buenos dias, you tell her. And I mumble to her my best textbook Spanish reading right after you. Hola, como estas? Buenas, she says. Tenemos nopalitos y maíz blanco en la troca, pígame. And you, of course, are already at the back of the truck, shoulder to shoulder, picking out what calls to you. I hope I have enough cash for this love trip, I think. Are you ready to go, Chula? I ask. You choose to not hear me. Wets in the air, light orange dirt mixes with sand and caliche under my chanclas. Thinking of getting to the water shakes my lungs, twitches my neck, makes me shuffle my ankles. The old brown woman hands you the wooden crate full of goodies. You take out cash from your pocket, wrap your arms around the abuelita, point and blow kisses to the baby and lucky kid, pass the crumpled cash into the lady's palm and turn to me smiling, wrinkling up the corners of your eyes that remind me of the future with you beside the water in South Texas. Who knows how much you paid her? Lucky me, I think. 
Ready, baby? You tell me. I'll drive. Yes, I am. Thanks. Moscas fly past our eyes. Maybe we will be brave enough to pick up some Mexicans, bring them over this time. We talk about it. Share the dulce de camote, cacahuates. The brown fr fruit vendors in the rear view get smaller, a reflection of the two of us in our windshield against a horizon of orchards and the school bus yellow Rio Hondo bridge calms me. I wake up at the water. We're here, you say. I choose not to hear you, choose to forget my shoes, step out into the wind and seagull songs. Black ocean spreads out in front of me and pushes up in between each of the cracks between my toes. White bubbling lines of foam soak into the dark blue of my jeans. Baby, you call me. Yes, I answer you this time because I feel safe here and a huge knot rolls down my throat, dissolving before it hits my stomach. I feel honest. Here, I think. Yes, I answer again. You choose to not hear me. Press into my behind. Slip your small brown hand in mine. Love you, I say. Inhale the wet air. Everything that is memory falls away. The drive, the kid, my parents who don't know I'm here with a girl, the ugly guy who stared at us like animals in the gas station. Everything that is memory falls away. The dry caliche, my skin, my baptism, my fat body, I'm ashamed of deep down back there. Everything that is memory falls away. Inhale the wet air, ocean, fish, sex, your legs, mujer, mar, my eyes are watering from the wind. My breathing is clear. The moisture cools my lungs, reminds me of Mentolato and my abuela. I breathe in the border over my shoulder, the ocean in front of us. Dig my eyes into the blackness of the horizon, step into the water and laugh. Step out of the water and laugh. Step in and laugh so hard. Our arms fold around each other, leaves of a sinvergüenza tree on the banks of the water. That uh, poem is in Entre uh, Malinche y Guadalupe, which um, is uh, the Hanas and Literature anthology. Check it out. Um, thank you. I don't know how long that was. So. Yeah, please keep going. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, wow. Ooh, I hadn't read that since, um, I mean, I had read it, but I mean, it just gets worse, what's happening at the border, so it's like, ooh, I think it just keeps welling, and then you just store it, and then you don't know it's there, and then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, it's really here, again, it's still here. Um, and of course, uh, you know, my wife, uh, she, we've been together 13 years, and she's a, a permanent resident, but um, that doesn't mean anything anymore, so that's like a whole other, um, another experience. Uh, doesn't mean anything really. So that's like a, it's been really Twilight zone -y. I was in Spain um, receiving that award when um, the first photo, I guess, was publicized last summer, not this past summer, but the summer before, um, of the children being detained. It was like that, it was like boom, all of a sudden. And I was gonna be there for eight weeks and I called her, it was like week two. And I was like, I'm going home right now. <laughs> and she was like, no. I was like, yes, because she's terrified, right? It's like, it doesn't mean anything. Again, it doesn't mean anything. I want you to remember that's a fact. It doesn't mean anything to permanent residents that they are not safe here. So even if you have that card, it's not safe in this situation, in this administration. And so I was like, no, I need to go because you know we have children. We also have two daughters. I was like, I'm just going to go because I know you're terrified. I know you're just like freaking out. And I don't want to be here. Like, I'm going to freak out. And she was so great so gracious and she's just like no like this is your life this is your career you just want an award and you need to deserve you deserve it and you need to be part of it and you need to stay there and you need to do the research and I'm like damn like we're really blessed and I never thought 25 years ago when I came out and the whole like the earth fell out from under my feet I did not know it would be this it would be this um, blessed right to have somebody in my life that got that that understood that the work isn't a game, right? So like for Joe and so, I mean, for all of us, it's not like this cute thing that you wake up doing. I mean, you're really doing it to replace the missing pieces that have been taken away from us, that have been silenced, that have been erased, that have been burned, you know? And so we have to create that. We have to write our history. I mean, we have to rewrite it 
from ourselves, from our perspective, not from you know whose perspective. I'm not gonna. That's another. That's another conference that just happened recently. Um, but you know, so that's she knows that that's why I'm doing the work, right? We're always doing the work. So this is another piece I wrote for her. It's a short little piece, and it's a little just sweet. It's called Pecado, and it's in my book Empanada, which there's a lot more work in it. But I'll just read this short little piece from it. Your back agridulce, your bottom interrupting your thighs, empalagosos, murmuring calves, ankles, torcido de nieve, dollop of heels, and pies trenzados. Feet, heels, ankles, calves, your thighs, bottom, back, neck, skin, sabor a tabaco dulce. I smoke to quench my thirst. Swooping curls scatter from the side of your face, behind your ear. The cold cavity of a guava, barely the tip of your nose peeks through a bundle of rounded leaves. I watch you sleep delectably and watch you and watch you instead of sleep myself or work or write a poem. Your hair is swooping the back of your ear, barely your nose, your neck, your back, your bottom, thighs, calves, ankles, heels, and feet. I am hanging from the fringe of my addiction Mi tentación, mujer chula. Dedicate that to her. Again, something I've been reading since 2016, but I, I just feel, I wasn't even going to read it, but put it away, and I was like, it's necessary, always, so, and it's connected to everything I've been talking about. It's not okay. June 12th, 2016. 49 shot dead and 53 injured at gay nightclub Pulse, Orlando, Florida. June 13th, the next morning, 9.15 a.m. I called my mom because I longed for the feeling of being a baby, a feeling of being held, a space to safely crumble and cry. And like any sweet, loving mommy who raised me on fresh frijoles and tortillas and kindness, she asked, are you okay, mija? I saw the news. I said no and wanted to tell her why. She interrupted me before I could elaborate or have any feelings. She told me, we need to pray, mija. The Virgencita Jesucristo is there waiting for us to give this election up to them. No, but mommy, I'm scared. And she continued, I know, I know, that's why our Lord wants you to go to him. I kept saying, I am scared, I am scared in my head. I wanted desperately for her to hear me, wanted her to just listen, like I wanted her to listen when I was scared 23 years ago, alone in my dorm, afraid because the student from Lubbock across the hall told me I was going to hell, and her Odessa, Texas boyfriend smeared dog shit on my car. But mommy stopped talking to me back then after she found out I was gay. I told her again, mommy, I'm scared of all the hate in the world right now. And she interrupted, mijita, I'm praying for our world, praying for the evil. And I remembered when she was, when I was told by praying people that I was evil for being gay, a disgrace, disgusting, committing mortal sin. Then I remembered that our soon to be president said those same words about me and all my LGBTQIA hermanos and hermanas, my brown and black and familia, my sisters, mi gente coming to the U.S. for dreams of peace. And then I remembered, but my mommy is not that see mean man I am afraid of. She loves me, but somewhere in all the battles she had to fight between being punished for speaking Spanish, degraded by white teachers, segregation, Vietnam, ovarian cancer, the Cold War, sexual assault from a boss, her lesbian daughter, and the things she has packed away behind survival, somewhere she became so scared she stopped <coughs> fighting. And I reminded myself that my mommy has come a long way, gone through a lot, loves my wife, my daughters, and me very much, so I tried again. I'm scared, mommy. I said, and our babies are scared too, they're afraid. I assumed my mommy would understand because she held my brother to her chest and promised to leave the country if he was called away to Vietnam. She was terrified and felt the way I feel today, so I tried again. Mommy, I'm scared of Donald Trump and the people he is fueling, I said, but something wouldn't let her hear me, something wouldn't let the fear in, and she interrupted again before I could continue. Mijita, we just have to pray. 
just wanted her to say she's gonna come over, maybe make me gallo or sit with me, but she didn't. I wanted her to say she was ready to fight for me, but she didn't. The mocos broke up into my nose and I wanted to tell her how scared I was yesterday, but she kept praying and telling me I would be okay. And under my breath on the other side of the phone, I said, but I am scared. I am scared to hold Erika's hand at the grocery store, mommy, just getting out of the car. And I wanted to tell her that I let go of my wife's hand in the parking lot when a huge pickup truck pulled up in front of us because I imagined someone jumping out to beat us like I had seen done before just years ago to a transgender woman on Main Street. I wanted to cry and release my fears, but she didn't let me speak. She told me again, Mika, it will be okay, and started to say goodbye. Tell Erika and the girls I love them, Mika. It was not okay when the old white man told my precious sacred wife, let me take you both home to feel what a real dick feels like. It was not okay when the male coach told me in a pep rally he wanted to rip the principal's red leather pants off and fuck her in the custodial closet just because I'm gay. It was not okay when my young gay student was tormented by groups of boys near the library over and over until one day he never returned to school only to hear he died in the bathroom of causes we were never told and a rope burn around his neck. It was not okay the day we realized we needed an LGBTQIA hotline just for our kids. It was not okay when my wife's ex-husband found it easy and foolproof to use our racist and homophobic laws to threaten her with the custody of our children and deportation. It was not okay when an adult man dragged my 13-year-old body to the beach, jammed his hands into my pants and my face into his, and it wasn't okay the three other times the same thing happened at 6, 11, and 16. It was not okay when our friend's daughter's breasts are being poked in the hallways and a football player is telling her to send naked pics or he will spread rumors about her. It was not okay when our daughter's friend was raped in her dorm by a swimmer at a Texas university. He got a slap on the hand. She dropped out of school because she was pregnant. It was not okay when I held my father's gun to my head because I believed my body was dirty and ugly and my soul was not worth living. And it is not okay that when you started reading this, a woman was sexually assaulted in the US and since then two more and before you are done, at least one more will be raped or grabbed or beat against her will. It is not okay, so do not tell me it is okay. I am scared, I have a right to be, and I am not going to just pray. I'm going to yell right back at the man who comes at me next time. I'm going to gather people together so we can walk hand in hand. I'm going to give my kente a safe place to land. I'm going to write our truths until someone listens. I'm going to walk with you to your car so no one can lay a hand on you. And I'm going to be a phone call away when you want to tell me how scared you are because this is not okay, and if you don't believe me, Read this again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Mm. Um, I remember. I remember Anel reading this at the Gemini uh, at Gemini Inc. conference. Uh, was last year or the year before, Nell, but I remember you reading this very poem. It was so moving because you know when you hear that poem, it's like many of us are like, me too, me too, me too. Uh, it, it, it unfortunately resonates with, with too many of us, so many of us. And I remember too at that particular conference up there in the, the seat, there was a, can you all hear me? Um, there was a, poet of some esteem, you know, a uh, male poet of some esteem on that stage. And right after you read that, decides to open up a discussion, well, I don't, he says, I don't get it. And then, and it's just, it was, it was infuriating. It was, it was, it, it just floored me. And I, I, and I have lost my speech to, to, to speak to that, to, to speak of, to that, um, you know, just an infuriating statement. And um, we talked a little bit, I think, after, you know, I met you at the hotel, you know, saw you in the hotel. And, uh, and I still cannot wrap my mind around that other than, and then we talked about, you know, the importance of listening, you know, this, of, of listening, as, as, you, as you, uh, the speaker in your poem, your poem talks about the importance of listening. Just, that is an incredibly powerful poem. And, uh, but, both, uh, all your poetry is so powerful, so thank you for, for bringing it uh, now in your presence. Uh, I want to introduce a student um, to read a poem, uh, Trev. Uh, would you like to come up? I'm going to introduce you.
interject, a, and then we'll and then we'll have Abigail Keegan uh, just we're doing some found poetry, a little bit of found poetry in a, in a poetry class, and uh, trying to talk about poetry is everywhere <laughs> in the language and how to arrange that. You know, as as a poet, we're conductors and we're arranging this this symphony of sound and imagery and in, in the sensory world and it's in all that. So Trev uh, wrote this, this found poem and I thought it was very appropriate to come and share in this environment. Um, so it wasn't planned. It was just yesterday or the day before and I just thought you gotta share this. But uh, Trev Trevino is a 22 year old San Antonio native. They are currently an undergrad student at Texas A&M here studying English along with teaching and TESOL certifications. Trev has been actively independently writing poetry and short stories for over five years, non-academically with themes of love, searching for one's identity and being part of the LGBTQ plus community. And most recently, they have been published in the Women Review and spoken at the, the Graduate Symposium Structures of Care here last March. So please join me in welcoming Trev Trevino. Sorry, I'm so ill prepared. <laughs> um, I was trying to think of what I wanted to say to um, give some context, but um, I too was up until like 5 or 6 a.m. writing other papers and doing other stuff, so mm -hmm. I apologize if I may ramble or um, lose my train of thought, stuff like that. So, um, to give some context, this is a uh, found poem, uh, a draft, and if you're unfamiliar with uh, found poetry, it's kind of just gathering words, phrases, or even sentences um, from other places and creating a type of poem with any kind of message and stuff like that. Uh, originally, I wanted to write about the many lives that were lost from uh, black trans women last year because it's, I have noticed that it's not very known, but unfortunately I couldn't really find enough work to, to really um, create something that was worth reading and um, still honor them enough at the same time. So instead I began to think as a trans individual, what or where that um, transphobia kind of stems from. And typically it's the lack of knowing of who we are and what it means to be part of the trans community or gender non-conforming or even a gender queer person. So um, so this poem is uh, articles of facts, interviews from, uh, from different celebrities who identify as trans gender non-conforming and as well as gender queer people. Um, as well, and uh, hate speech from people such as Mike Bloomberg and um, some random people on the internet. So uh, the title of this poem is called Hashtag Trans is Beautiful. It is a hashtag that um, celebrity Laverne Cox made a while back. She talks about how she kind of made that hashtag for herself to kind of remind herself who she is and that she is valid. And it ended up becoming a viral uh, hashtag. So I thought it was pretty fitting for the poem. So, yeah. Oh, also, before I start, sorry, sorry. Um, I just wanted to give a content warning and possibly a trigger warning to anybody that might feel uncomfortable. I'm obviously going to talk about trans individuals, violence against trans individuals. Uh, there's like a curse word or two, just in case. And um, I think that is about it. Oh, and talking about uh, gender dysphoria, stuff like that, so. Hey guys, it's me, Nikki. Today, I'm here to share something with you. Yes, there is a word for me. Never have I once seen myself properly represented on like a big platform under my own circumstances, and it looks like that chance has been taken away from me some guy in a dress. For me personally, my body matters. When one's physical appearance doesn't correlate with how they mentally feel that shit, I am my own masculinity. I'm chill man, I'm 18 years old, I'm genderqueer. However, 
This does not mean I identify male. I feel most masculine in a skirt. Crossdresser. I went from gender fluidity to being non-binary. Now I identify as a non-binary trans girl. Those of us who are those of us who are gender non-conforming are dismissed. Sometimes it feels like I've lived two lives without rules, without labels, without any restrictions. I've had to medically transition so that the world can see my spirit. Isn't he trying to be something he's not? P stands for pay it no mind. I don't feel like there's anything mannish about me. I connect more to masculine bodies. We were raised to believe there's something wrong with us. When I was younger, I was born in the wrong body. There is no official federal source on how many transgender people are killed in a given year. Female impersonator. There's such little representation for disabled bodies, people with disabilities, and black trans women. Folks almost always focus on transition and surgery. Those kinds of conversations objectify trans people. People always want to know when we knew we were different. When did you know that you weren't? Out of 111, out of 157, transgender, gender non-conforming victims of fatal violence have been black trans women since 2013. Again, I'm going to uh, introduce Abigail Keegan now, who I've been trying to introduce for three years. Um, <laughs> three years over here. One year there was like this flu epidemic, and then the, then there was a bust, tried, busted ankle from ice in Oklahoma the day flying over here last year. You <laughs> slipped under the car, and so we're, we're here. You made it. Yay. You know? And uh, yeah. yeah. Miguel Keegan's poems have appeared in such journals as the Malpays, Pilgrimage Magazine, Switchgrass Review, Windward, the Blue Rock Review, the Journal of Southern Culture and Literature, and anthology, many anthologies. She's published three poetry collections, The Feast of the Assumptions, Oklahoma Journey, and depending on the weather, a finalist for the Oklahoma Book Award. She is a professor emeritus of English at Oklahoma City University. So please join me in welcoming Abigail Keegan. Well, Robin, thank you for having me here. And I'm glad there was no disaster before I came. I was a little nervous when you said, why don't you come back? I thought, God, what could happen next? <laughs> but it's nice to be here with all of you. Um, it's also funny to be the old lady on the queer panel. Um, it's just an interesting, you know, but I've gone through many evolutions of the idea of gay, uh, of the idea of homosexual, um, gay, lesbian, you know, the whole, I've gone through the generations of this mm -hmm. and it's a, a very interesting phenomenon to watch where we are now and the, uh, you know, new kinds of questions that people are speaking aloud. They've always thought them, um, you know, but the things that we're able to articulate. Um, and I, uh, in my academic work, I, I wrote a book about Byron and his uh, sodomitic life and the influence of um, his homosexuality on his poetry because people had written about his bisexuality or his homosexuality or however they were identifying him, but they never wrote about how it influenced his poetry, which I thought was, so was a nice open door to enter to. So um, I just retired, you heard Professor Emeritus, and um, so I'm getting the, to get to look back at my life at some of the high points and you know some of the things that have really marked me. And um, I just recently wrote this and um, thought it was quite, appropriate, I guess, for this panel. It's called The New Year. I often think of going back to see what's left, 
to see how years let earth grow wild with thistle and weeds to cover her garden of flowers at the old house. I loved a woman then, the one my father said I'd killed by bringing her into a sinful lifestyle. She liked to stay up late combing through Chekhov, mysteries, southern gothic tales, brushing her hair in the slightest light, making a shimmer. We spent days teaching, evenings and weekends, working with women's political caucus, a women's shelter, a women's press, the first pride parades, occasionally dancing in a dark, smoky bar, often raided by police. For a while, I worried my father was right, not about sin, but that our lifestyle simply wore out the healthy cells of her body and let a cancer grow. I often traveled to Singapore back then, and once I heard a child on the subway say to her mother, no, the heart's not like that. Don't draw it like two birds, draw it like a fist. One New Year's Eve, ice hung heavy on eaves and spread thick across our front hill. Anne, after driving 12 hours from Tennessee to get back home to me, threw suitcases across lawn ice. I pulled her up the incline so we could spend New Year's Eve together. I had the table set with candlelight, hopping John with black-eyed peas, cornbread, and as always, cranberries on the side her recipe for a year of luck. Chekhov told that story, the story of a guy who loved gooseberries. It was a simple but intense devotion. Still, the story involved loss. After an evening of memory, I can say I love another woman now. We have continued working with women for a change of world, and I can say I am often happy but such things are impermanent. Better to say it is possible to work and love again, yet not simple. You and I sit quietly tonight reading. The light from separate lamps sets us apart, but the room, somehow larger than any I have ever known before, admits everything I know own into this new year light. So, in the 2013-2014, the where there was all the discussion of you know whether we're going to be able to have gay marriage, and I mean it's been going on longer than that, but the, you know it, the discussion intensified as we got closer to the reaching of uh, gay people having full citizenship rights in the United States. Um, I wrote this poem, and. Uh, as a kind of as a point of irony, there's so much fear of gay marriage, and so this should really be called a gay wedding, but I called it gay marriage because of the time that it was written in, and I just recently uh, rewrote the end of it, even though it was already published. I'm awful about doing that, just with the memory. Um, because my part, my current partner and I um, have been together for 25 years, so I wanted to you know, give this to her for our anniversary. So it's called Gay Marriage 1995. When we were in Arkansas, a cottage garden grew like wildflowers up to the door and down a hill to an evergreen hedge. A cottontail rabbit sheltered himself in the shelf of a stone ledge while we held hands on a swing amid bee sweet music. Soft wind tossed pink crepe myrtle confetti about our nuptials, and hummed an ode to joy through the leaves of large sweet gum trees, as we promised our bodies to honor, our goods to share, our words to come from the separate poetry of selves into another song. No minister, no crowd looked on to bless or to den deny our forsaking of all others, only we, the rabbit and the bees, under the gentle shade trees, we were there that day to say with vows, here is love, united in the breath of true words and in our loving. So do any of you know who Diane and Ayad is? 
she was a, a worked for NPR um, as a reporter for a while, and also she's a big swimmer. And um, in 2013, uh, she swam from Cuba to Key West, and she had tried three times to do that. It's you know 60 miles. And I saw a film about her, and one of the things that uh, she talked about several times during that film was the fact that she had been molested by her stepfather, um, who was both her coach and, uh, you know, promoter. And um, it was it was the connection between the the molestation and then her great achievement that you know it, was, it kept going back and forth in her discussion, and so I wanted to think about that, and I'm a swimmer and I have a similar background, so I wanted to think about how that, the power of that swim uh, might have been a force against you know, what had happened to her. But this is called For Those Who Have Not Drowned, a tribute to Diana Nyad, 2013. Men have made nymphs and mermaids, a Venus rising from a seashell, but none of these, like Nyad swimming the sea, Cuba to Key West, cast goddesses of beauty or sacrifice. In a new wave of myth, dolphins ride round her legs as she propels her body through salt water, which soaks skin to bone, pearls through her hair. The sea scrubs her clean of fingerprints left by the man whose touch drowned her childhood. Her hands pull history to herself. Her arms hit against the water, breaking the silence. The story of loss and grief, cupped in her hands, repeats in laps of the swim. She pushes the story down. She lifts, pushes down, lifts, pushes down. Memories of childhood drown in the brine of tears. She lifts, muscles tighten, push down and lifts until she becomes one with the water. Her lips are swollen red lobsters, her legs a tail. Pain and the past spill and begin their drift until a jellyfish stings, bring her, brings her back into time, arm over arm, miles of memory, past shores of shame. She forwards faster to the place no child can reach alone, to the place she must choose to drown, absorbed into the great nothingness, or she must swim. And Nyad swims, swims until her hands touch the land. She rises from the sea. She stands a goddess, legs wobbling, looking back at the great distance. She licks salt from her lips, gulps the air, and lets it flood her body until the corpuscles of her soul are filled. are on uh, in written history um, and this was on Long Island Sound. She worked from there from 1829 to 1883. One photo of her face remains, a creased cartography of labor, dark hair drawn taut against island wind, her hands hidden. We miss seeing the taper of fingers that kept the records of prism cleaning, black brass polishing, the size of hands that seeded oyster beds, tilled gardens, and tended chickens, or drafted litanies to weather. Snows swirl and drift, storms increase, winds shove against the rock. Private reflections were slight descriptions of lighthouse life. I never thought this life unusually hard. I was fitted to it. The girl of 12 fitted her hands to keeping the light. 
Kate held to a liturgy of all hours, twilight to midnight, and in the wee hours of morning before the lauds of sunrise, she lifted and poured gallons of whale oil and trimmed the wicks of eight great lamps. Even when sunsets tilted under serene skies and the restless world let the girl rest in house, she lay dressed in a boy's suit, a lighted lantern hanging on a headboard, her face turned toward the tower, watching the stars and her light. For 50 years, wind talons yanked her body from a warm bed to walk 40 rods on slippery planks, snow and water blinding, the ocean's body rising every minute to meet hers. Bone soaked and bone wearied, she climbed wet or frozen ladder rungs, wrestling wild gusts of the relentless universe. Like a small god, she divided the visible from the invisible, her light separating the sea, the sails, the perilous curves of the sound, swells of storm tossed, tore and plunged, square rigger, schooners or sloops, turning them upside down or rushing them to ground. Hundreds of ships, sailors swam or rafted, breaking against the island. Some Catherine wrenched from the sea into a small skiff that grunted under the muscled grip of her arms and back, her own life tossing back and forth in the balance of the boat. On land, she sutured sailors' weathered hide wounds, fed and listened to men with nothing left save nightmares, sea monsters, stories of madness rising on the wind and memories stuck like fishbone in their throats. For the hundreds dead and washed to shore, she, as her father before her, bore witness on Fairweather Island. Much is mystery. We know her nights knew no rest, yet nothing of how many days passed without a human voice. Only the whistling and roaring company of the sea drifting with her alone along the shore past abandoned shells of life, a cracked crow's nest, shredded sails of lifeless boats, shackles of slave ships, ghosts scuttling across the beach, gold-plated oarlocks, wind jammer masts, or the worn figurehead, love surrounded by wings, fingered slowly to treasure all things lost. Little is known of her books or why she planted Alanthus trees over the island. She may have read, as I, that for the Chinese, the trees serve as paths to heaven and hoped for the Alanthus to hoist lost sailors into the bright light of the world. What is certain, long wintry nights shoaled her into an island of solitude. But even after her father's death, she kept at her work, listening to salvation and loss, pound against the shore, one wave covering another, trusting the depths of her own loneliness, never to reach that of sailors drowned in the darkness. There is strangeness in the restless ships sailing the world, mystery in weather, sea, and sky, shadow over the history of a woman alone, keeping the light. Yet when I stood on the coast of Connecticut, looking to her lighthouse, I was certain that at her death, the great heart of the ocean had waved her on. Alanthus trees lifted her dust to the lighthouse of the stars until at last she became the light.
it's a very it's a precious precious time here. Um, just, we don't have much time. I'm not going to read because we've got about five minutes still for any kind of questions or discussion um, from the audience. Please we'll, we welcome any questions.
Coastal Bay Wellness Community Center here in Corpus. A, a, a lot of resources as well, literature, and so we want to let you know about that. Uh, but Anel, would you would you be able to send that information to me also so that I can post it? Sure. Um, so again, thank you very much, and we'll move on to our next. Get take a breather and a stretch. And we'll take